What's going on, secondhand talent family? It's your boy Steiner here, as always, and uh, he needs no introduction. We're going to get right into it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, episode 10, the first of a four part series with the one, the only rock poster legend, Justin Hampton. Justin, thank you so much for being here. Hey, what's happening, man? My pleasure. Absolutely. Uh, we're we're in, incredibly grateful that 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 you could join the program um and we do have a traditional question that we like to ask our guests at the top of each show um what does secondhand talent if i you had never heard the term before what does secondhand talent mean to you Neither um reaction it, it literally makes me think of uh like chancing upon a a painting at goodwill <laughs> like, you want to like you want really to cool... expound on that a little bit sure yeah yeah just like a really cool weird painting that uh uh completely out of the blue you, you chance upon something that might be covered in dust and you knock off the dust and you're like hey what is this this is pretty yeah. cool i mean yeah. like i i can speak to that i think first of all that is that is apt I mean, it's it's because, you know, secondhand talent, you know, one of the things we like to say, it's not that the talent's any less. It's just overlooked. Right. I've got a buddy who uh, who's a very famous artist, actually, who has taken those paintings, much like I think Banksy has done before, too, where they take like a landscape that's like really highly skilled by some random person that wound up in a Goodwill. And they find it in a vintage shop or Goodwill and they end up like adding their own characters into the painting and making it look seamless and it turns out like freaking amazing so, so there's some hidden gems if, there that can be turned into something new so if yeah. i'm understanding what you're saying they're 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 kind of taking these pre-existing masterpieces and just like yeah. adding their own artistic spin to it and thus right. not just not just showing their own style but prolonging the legacy of these paintings that yeah. are not any less talented just a little overlooked um, yeah and the cool thing is too leaving their name intact and making it this collaboration with this yes random, yes random unknown person it's pretty cool a rising tide lifts all ships you always got to bring people up when you get a chance well anyway uh we're, we're here uh justin has a book coming out called visual feast uh it is a career retrospective clocking in at a whopping 444 pages long and we are going to get to how we got to that number a little bit down the road Obviously, you've been your career in this has been long. You've been doing art for a while. How did you kind of get to the point where you were like, art, art's for me? Right. Well, I mean, I always drew from a young age. I think I had the inclination. I think it's similar for any creative, like, you know, someone who likes music, you can kind of tell early on. So my mom was very creative herself, and she kind of nurtured that and would always give me paper and crayons and I would copy comic book characters, you know, in my uh, budding style as a, you know, little stick men sure. developing further and further into, you know, I came up with my own characters and it was just really fun. So that was the beginning. And then uh, as time went on, I was continuing to be very interested in that kind of thing and copying famous comic book artists who I liked or, you know, album covers or whatever, my own budding style, you know. Sure. And then uh, at the same time in grade school, going into junior high, I was, I loved football. I was playing football, you know, on the teams in fifth and sixth grade. Sure. I went into seventh grade and uh, I was much smaller than the other kids because I could, that, this is back when you could start early, like a year right. or two early than other kids, which they don't let you do now. But so I was always much smaller and it wasn't like a massive difference until puberty hit for the other kids and not for me. <laughs> And then going into the gym and being like, yeah, football and looking at all these like dudes that just turned giant of kids that I like, <laughs> yeah. knew that were similar size and suddenly they were huge. And I just was like, um, no, art, it's going to be art. And I just turned around <laughs> and walked out of, the, of the, the gym going like, well, career choice is now made. It's definitely not never looking back, <laughs> never looking back. Well, I'm going to be an artist. <laughs> I, I can relate to that on a deeply personal level. When I when I realized my two youngest, uh, the brothers right, the two brothers right under me had incredible dexterity with uh, musical instruments, and I was, you know, all thumbs with like twelve different digits, and uh, that's why I became a comedian. <laughs> yeah, 
I mean, these are the early uh, turning points in the in the road that leads us ahead. You know. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. I mean, well, you know, it's funny that you say. You know, well, not funny, but you know, I, I also really related to what you said earlier because my earliest influence is Weird Al. And okay. a lot of a lot there's a video of eight year old me with a fake beard on in a strimal singing <laughs> Amish Paradise somewhere. Um, awesome. But oh yeah, oh I was I was way into it. And when I was in grade school, I would write parodies. And for me, that was a way of not only getting out my creativity, but emulating my hero. Yeah. And I know I mean, that's, and as a fellow comic book fan, those are our heroes. For sure. Absolutely. And that's what you do is as you begin, you know, you copy other stuff because it helps give you confidence and you learn chops and you pick up, you know, things in whatever craft you're pursuing and, and uh, you start to find your own voice eventually. But I think all, all the, the solid, you know, creatives out there have done that from the beginning, you know, whether it's the blues, you know, for like Led Zeppelin influencing them early on to becoming this mega band, you know, the early influences set you on your path, you know. Absolutely. And there was a little local punk team of a handful of kids that loved punk rock that would organize and reach out and write letters to different bands. And so we actually got to see some bands that made little pit stops in Medford, Oregon or Ashland, Oregon. And it was like Black Flag with Henry Rollins and, you know, all GOA right. and I mean, yeah. Agent 86 and all these bands that stopped in because they were like, hey, there's a little scene here. And so that was my first exposure to going to shows was like kind of legendary punk bands, you know, at the end of that era, you know, so that was really fun. I mean, I mean, and that combination then. So we've got art, we've got music. Um, right. You know, we were talking about kind of, um, you know, this beginning and as we are approaching the uh, release date of Visual Feast, which is this massive retrospective. And I know what you address it in the book, um, by the way, links in the description on how to get more information about that. Um, but what sort of significance did this take for you? as you not only in the moment but as you look back on it to create this retrospective i mean it was something that god when i was a kid or even a teenager i would look at books like that in a bookstore and with just such incredible wonder and just kind of like try to grasp what it would be like to not only be a professional published artist but to eventually have the volume of work that it would you know makes sense to have a retrospective book and it was just such an incredible thing of like i just couldn't quite wrap my mind around how wild that would be to be in that place where you're now looking back and you just have this like body of work that is so big it requires a book to show it off an entire large book it was something that was like that would be really really cool but it was almost hard to imagine but i remember distinctly going like someday that would be cool you know and it's uh it's a really weird thing now to be here and go, wow, that was something I wanted someday. And now that's someday yeah. it's here. It's a strange it's a, thing. It's cool. It's awesome. It's just, it's very trippy <laughs> at the same time. Sure. But, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a monumentous occasion. Um, and, you know, I guess this kind of leads me into my next question, which is, you know, now we're talk, starting to talk about, you know, the capstone of your professional career, but where did that career begin? Um, good question. Honestly, it uh, it started as a little kid. You know, uh, my stepdad would come home from work and he would stop into like a little, uh, I guess it was more like a antique shop or, a, you know, a little boutique kind of thing. And they just had like stacks of comics. And these comics, part of their... Uh, policy was that if you bring if you take a stack of comics you can buy it and you can take them home come back and give them back and they give you a new stack of comics which is really crazy to think about it's, it's like, like an, it, making, it's like a comic money? book amnesty system <laughs> right so, <laughs> so uh, we read through these comic books voraciously and i remember distinctly like reading reading before i could read and there were just sure. little ants in these bubbles and I remember distinctly thinking, like, when Spider-Man got his spider sense and his, the little waves came out of his, around sure. his head. Absolutely. 
I remember thinking, man, he's really scared. His hair is like standing out of his mask. That's weird. He must be freaked out. <laughs> I wish I could tell what these little ants said in the bubbles. Oh, you know? Peter. <laughs> oh, Peter. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so it began with, you know, emulating that stuff and, you know, getting paper and drawing Spider-Man or drawing whatever. And, you know, that was my first, like, exposure to art in the sense of, like, having it tangibly in my hands. And, and, uh, and so as time went on, I became really into that thing. I got, I began to read, of course, and I started following storylines and collecting and, and emulating that and always trying new styles and all this stuff. So eventually I got to a point where in the early mid eighties that Marvel put out a, what was called a Marvel tryout book. And it was a book where you could try out to be anything in the studio that they had, which was either a writer, penciler, inker, letterer, colorist. And they had pages that were there in like blue line form that you could ink on top of John Romita Jr.'s work. And so I was like, this is cool because I really enjoyed yeah. that part of it because you're enhancing someone else's work and embellishing yes. it. Sure. That, real specifically, you know, you mentioned a, a category of things and as an avid comic book fan myself, having a copy of Twitch, um, if you're not familiar, Google it. It's uh, coming up on how, how, how 25 years? Is that? Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's no, next year it will be 30 years. But I wow, okay. I, I I mean, I've had... 30 it. years ago, I was working yeah. on it. Like wow. this year. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, okay, so we're really talking about... So, you know, I love those different aspects because as a stand-up comedian, there are so many different stages um, and I really appreciate how uh, comic books, graphic novels specifically are a coalescence of all of these talents. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, like of those segments that you mentioned, writer, colorist, letterer, inker, you know, um, where, where were you most attracted to? I mean, at first it was just inking because it was, uh, I mean, I would say honestly, my skill set as a, uh, as a penciler, as a, full-on artist which just wasn't there yet sure. and inking was a way to interpret someone else's work and almost absorb their not talent but like ideas well and to emulate to yeah yeah exactly so you could do that in kind of like uh there's a learning process because sure. as you went through it you were redrawing your stuff in a, in a sense you know so i started putting together samples and sending samples to marvel comics at age 14 and um, it's it sounds funny now, but it's what like, sparked you know, that? What in the I'm world? I'm sorry, at age 14. Like, I mean, I'm just so I mean, curious. Like, what I mean, was the input? Was it that book? Was it that? It was that book, and the fact that they said that you could send it. There was an address that you could send it to. Kind of bless Stanley because oh. it was called a tryout book. That's what it was. Sure, called. sure, yeah. yeah. So, absolutely. Um, what a way! So to, what just, a great way to get talent. Absolutely, and I just I. I think I had, I always had in my career more drive than talent. Like it mm. took a while for the talent to catch up to the drive that I had. Sure. So I was just sure. like, you know, I would look in comics and I would see some comic artists that I considered to be not all that great. And then there were ones that were like, holy crap, these are legends. You know what I mean? So I was, I, and this is my thought, the illustration, the rock posters later, all, I was like, I'm at least as good as the worst one. You know, so with that idea, I was like, it gave me confidence to go, well, why not? And uh, it was really cool to find out that some did. I got some really amazing letters back from different editors at Marvel that were like, wow, this is really good. Send more. Keep keep trying. Keep sending. Keep improving. And so I, I mean, did. so like I just all through high school, I sent I did I worked on samples and kept sending them samples and getting good responses. And sometimes you'd get no response. And that was, you know, sure. kind of like really kind of heartbreaking. But at the same time, you're like, yeah, I'll just do another one, you know. And so I kept doing that. And eventually, you know, I graduated high school and I was like, I can't just stay in Medford doing tryout pages. <laughs> I got to make a plan sure. and get out of here. So my, my mom's best friend had gone to a school in Seattle that uh, was no more, but there was another school that had absorbed a lot of the teachers and she was like, you'd probably really love Seattle when it was close. You know, it was only eight hours away north. And uh, I was looking at a few different schools, but she swayed me on the one in Seattle. And uh, I had no idea what was happening in Seattle. Nobody did. You know, I was just like, right. I'm just going to art school. 
and then uh yeah in fact it's it was really funny too even because this is the grunge era you know 87 the very beginning of it yeah my because uncle was a part of it with sub pop yeah oh that's awesome right on yeah yeah so it was uh my mom was a hairdresser and I'd always had my hair really, really short. And she'd cut my hair every two weeks because my hair grew really fast. And I just, I was like, I'm moving to Seattle. I'm not going to have my mom anymore. I'm just going to let my hair grow. And then when I got to Seattle, I looked around. It's like, there's all these dudes with long hair. What is this about? I, I don't, what? That's weird. That everyone all at once has decided to grow their hair long. I was just like, okay. It wasn't like, a trend. I thought it was me. just it me. Like, what? It was just me. Yeah, yeah. And then it's like, all right, whatever. This is weird, you know. And then slowly I found out about the music scene and there were local bands and I started listening to local uh, college radio, K KCMU is what it's called back then. Now it's KEXP, it still exists. Oh, um, fantastic. Love and so I just was like, this, this band is local? This Nirvana band is local? That's really weird. This is good, you know? And this is pre any of these bands being known. It's interesting because you hear about, you know, from the perspective of when you know everything started becoming popular a lot when you hear about this kind of thing you don't hear you know the oh it was just another garage band that was around you know what i mean and that's yeah. the perspective i had at the time was it was just you know once i realized how much of it was going on and how good it was mm. there came a point before all these bands became popular and blew up you know, internationally that I knew how special it was. Like, I didn't know, like, on a legendary status it was going to be like that, but I knew that it was, like, something pretty special. Like, kind of like... Was there any band or couple bands in particular? In the 60s, you know what I mean? That kind of vibe before it went popular. That's what it felt like. Sure. I mean, I mean, my bands that I first really hooked into was, you know, Nirvana Bleach, which was very different than what they became. It was super edgy yeah. and, and... Oh, absolutely. Gritty and... Mud Honey too, really loved Mud Honey. Um, and I saw these bands in like tiny clubs, you know, when before I mean everyone in the local scene, which was very small, knew about it and would go to the shows, but on a national level, I mean there might be some little zines that knew, but there wasn't many people, you know, at that point. So it was very special, you know, felt special at the time, you know. I mean, sure, you know, you're not just there, but you're with the with these bands that see that in you and again you know it gets back to that theme of like people wanting to be around you in the scene which is a really cool feeling yeah i mean this was before i even got started doing the music stuff this is like or doing posters or flyers or anything that was just like cool stuff and then there became a moment where it kind of coalesced where i was like oh art and music together you know what I mean? And not comic book. I was doing comic book stuff, but I started gravitating toward this music stuff. And part of that was after I graduated art school, I started working for the local music magazine called The Rocket, which was kind of like the Northwest version of like Rolling Stone, you know? Okay. And it was all the upcoming bands and, you know, politics, op-eds. There was all these kind of things. So I would do illustrations for album reviews, upcoming movie reviews, political op-eds you know all these things so and then i started getting asked to do flyers because everyone that worked there was either musicians or they were a promoter for a venue or and that's where it was like sure you know take 25 bucks and some free beer at the show you know right and it was you know there was no it wasn't like oh my god this is a great career idea it was just like right, right. it was just like this is a cool <laughs> thing to do why sure, not why, why not? not get into it yeah yeah so so that's how that started, just coalescing as like another cool thing to do. I was getting paid doing magazine illustration, you know, and now suddenly I'm getting to do flyers this big and on poles everywhere. And everyone's saying, I saw your illustration in the magazine, but I saw the flyer. That was huge and cool. And I'm like, and was right, that like a, was that like a, 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 a turning point moment for you where you were just like, oh, people are saying they saw a flyer that's 20 feet tall. Is that like? I mean, oh, wow, cool. this is interesting. It was cool, but it wasn't like, there, I didn't see any way to make money at it. I literally was like, sure. that's cool. Okay. It was a good, it was a good PR, you know, but it wasn't like, interesting. yeah, and my, and my black and white flyers going for $20 a pot. No, there was no such thing, you know, at that point. It was right. just the money I made at the venue and getting in the show for free and having some free beer. 
that was that was all it was. I didn't I didn't make the connection at all. In fact, it wasn't until a couple of years later because I did my first flyer was for Nirvana. It was in 1990, the first return show from Europe when they had their first big European tour. Got it. And uh, and it was just a flyer. I, I I did it for an art class. I didn't do it officially. And I put it for the college that you were referring to. Was it like an art class yeah, for yeah. just did a Nirvana? Yeah. And okay. just for the hell of it. It was a typography class. Right. And it was yeah, sure. Type. Yeah. <laughs> And I just put up a few just to see what it felt like. And I, and I saw a few around and it was kind of fun and I went to the show and it was awesome. And, but again, I didn't see there being any potential for money. It was just a flyer. Right. You know, it was just, right. and it was for an art class, you know. So it wasn't until a couple of years later where promoters kept asking me to do flyers. And then all of a sudden they were like, we started to get hey, like the, would you like to do a screen print? Here's, here's, oh my God, we can do two colors. And I was like, ooh, red and black. This is amazing. <laughs> you know sure and they paid me a little more and uh and then i saw an article actually in the rocket magazine where they covered the uh the newly emerging poster scene with uh art chantry was the art director at the time he was a local you know northwest tacoma based but also seattle with the rocket uh graphic designer he did lots of local posters and then fred kozik and then all of the coop and it started showing this thing that was coming out of the out of the bay area in la and they covered it and they included a bunch of color you know posters and, and i was like "Ooh, this is cool now this i dig right and i was like okay how, how does this work you know and then uh you know uh, the unfortunate passing of frank kozik just recently god bless the soul absolutely, he absolutely. was a god. titan of the industry and uh really kind of the godfather of modern posters in that uh, when Juxtapose magazine came out, he did an article where he literally wrote and broke it down how to make money doing this thing. So I read the rocket thing, saw the thing about posters. This is really cool. Wow. Okay. And then shortly after that, 94, or something like that, Kozik wrote a little thing and he's like, here's how you do this. You reach out to promoters, which I was already doing. Yeah make some flyers, posters, screen prints, whatever, you know, and then you reach out to various uh, galleries around the country that carry this kind of thing that have rock memorabilia. And you say, Hey, would you like to buy some of these on wholesale? And he just kind of broke down the whole, like, this is how you do it and go make posters. And I wasn't the only one that read this. There was like all kinds of people that read this, Jermaine Rogers, Emmett, all these well, people, we all read this stuff and it went right on. And that was the the big light bulb moment of like, fuck yeah, I'm gonna do this. I I, I recall when 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 Frank passed, um, I, I I saw that you had made a post about it. And obviously, um, you know, I I've been a fan of Frank's for just as long as I've been a fan of you and Jermaine and Emek, and I, I saw that I saw that Emek uh, commented on your post um, that you know there was this time when you know you and he and Jermaine were his you know his kids you know in the scene and uh right. that 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 really touched me right. i'm sure there are some stories about him in the book there's well he wrote a uh he i asked him i mean i've known frank since the 90s i mean when i was sure first, sure, sure sure yeah uh, getting published through art rock which was the next phase after i followed this trajectory i started sending stuff to our gallery and they liked my stuff and started publishing their work and uh you know, I always reached out to professionals to get input and, uh, critis you know, creative criticism and pointers and what kind of thing. And, you know, I remember reaching out to Frank and he just was like, yeah, give me a call, you know, and uh, and he was just super supportive and cool. He was like a, a mentor and like older brother, and just such a welcoming, cool, sharing dude, you know, and he was always down to give, you know, input and you know, suggestions. And so all these years later, you know, when I asked him to give me a quote for the book, he, uh, this is just the kind of guy he was. He was like, sure, I'll, you know, no problem, I'll write something. And then he writes me back, you know, a week later, and he's like, I wrote four, pick your favorite. 
Like, I, I think I he mentioned writes, maybe as a W to put quotes. them all four on a handbill. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Uh, no, that would be cool. An insert. Um, I mean, I think it would be a beautiful tribute, um, especially yeah. you know because he was such a formative part of that that visual feast that we're coming to expect. Um, for sure. Uh, we are out of time for part one of our four parter with Justin Hampton. Uh, for secondhand talent, I am Steiner. Justin, thank you again so much, and I can't wait to pick it up with you next week. Absolutely, man. We'll talk soon. Later. Bye.